So you've made it to the final section of the final module on the 80% occupancy elevator. So let's rip straight in and educate you all around yield operating rhythms. These are the habits we want you to establish in, the, in your business to help you with your yielding principles and your revenue management. Um, so first of all, uh, like we've talked previously, I guess in a number of the module, we talk a lot about rhythms and, and I guess a, a term we also use is healthy habits. It really is comes down to that. A lot of this stuff, when it comes to say reviews and your, your numbers and your sales rate, all that sort of stuff, it comes down to the habits and the routines and the things you're building into the operation that ultimately deliver results to the bottom line. Uh, and this is no different. When it comes to yielding, it's about building the habits and the processes into the operation that actually help you live and breathe revenue management as a principle in your hotel. So a yield op operating rhythm could be constructed daily, weekly, monthly. It, it really is up to you how often you want to be doing this. But as I've mentioned earlier, doing some level of yielding is better than doing none. And I'm happy for you to build up as you go over time. But let me sort of, I guess, fast forward you to where we feel you should be. Um, when it comes to a, an operating rhythm. So you can see on the screen there, you, you probably can't read every, every piece of detail, but the basic principle is that on a daily basis, you wanna be doing a, a forward scan. And there's, this, there's a little bit of crossover here on the last module we talked about data and reporting. So we'll talk about data and reports and how often to be looking at them. It's a, it's a very similar field, it's, it's, it's virtually the same, but similar principles that um, on a daily basis, you want to be scanning forward in a, in a shorter term window. Because you, you can't scan forward 365 days every single day. You'd spend all day in, in the office and get nothing else done. So if you've got some data and reporting in front of you where you can have a scan forward and say, okay, what's happening for the next week, two weeks, maybe up to a month, you go, yeah, yep, yeah, righto. Got some context now, make some adjustments. On a weekly basis, we'd encourage you to actually have a yield meeting. Now, large team, small team, no team, I still encourage you to have a yield meeting. And so there's a designated time every week where you stop, you sit down, and with someone, and hopefully you're not the only one in the business, you've at least got a partner that you can work with here, and you actually look at the numbers and discuss. And the point is to get some outside perspective. Um, because if you're just the one looking at the numbers all the time, you can get a little bit insular. So we want to get some outside perspective and see if we can pick up on some other, other things. Now the scope of a yield meeting on a weekly basis is to scan a little bit further ahead and you know, push it out to, you know, out to the 60 day mark. Um, you may have a, a, you know, a, a quick scan every now and then. A bit further, if you can just see an anomaly, oh wow, what's that, bang, let's change that. If you've, if you've got your, your spreadsheet set up with some conditional formatting and you can see some reds and greens coming up further down the calendar, certainly take a quick look. But the, the focus really is around you know, the next 60 days um, and you want to be comparing to your targets, how you're going, and a, just a bit of a general discussion. Create a little agenda for yourself around, well, what are the discussion points here that we're going to talk about every week at the same time every week with the broader team? And then on a monthly basis, it's just a, a, a further extension. You're certainly looking up to a 90-day focus. You're looking at the month gone, looking, potentially sitting down looking at a, a month-end performance report. Looking further ahead, is there anything else we need to adjust on a more macro basis? And definitely, definitely looking at the full 12 months ahead. Um, have a scan over the next 12 months, but definitely look at your pricing for the month you've just had. So if you've just finished March, have a look at March next year. What's your pricing? What happened this year? Therefore, what pricing am I setting next year? And you don't want to be exposed. You don't want to be having high rates out there when this year, this month was terrible or periods of that month was terrible, terrible. And you don't want to also equally be having discounted rates out there when this month was really strong. And part of that picture is obviously those events that are coming up. You don't really know um, what demands in the marketplace just yet, but if you've got a, a scope on what events are happening, that, that is really important to look that full 12 months ahead and set the next month's pricing. And if you're in a rhythm and a routine of doing that, you're constantly setting 12 months ahead and, and not leaving you exposed. You know, there's not too many people book more than 12 months ahead. Sometimes even like 18 months ahead for a wedding, say. But um, when you see those weddings come in, you'll actually make some adjustments then and there on the spot anyway. But being in that rhythm is all about, I guess, catching the gaps without loading you up with a whole stack of work. 
It's about having a, a systemized approach to be viewing far enough ahead on a regular enough basis so you can find the opportunities or find the exposure points and do something about them. So still on yield operating rhythms, this one here is about developing you know, potentially a, a rate tier structure. Now this is a very simplified version that we've just thrown together for demonstration purposes. But um, if, I guess if we step back from that rate tier, and you know, this is really a dynamic thing, but you've got that choice. You could have a, a static pricing structure, and I think I've been pretty clear about what I think of a full-blown static pricing structure. You may have a seasonal pricing structure. You may ha have a day of week pricing structure, so weekends versus week, weekdays. Um, and, and the more you head down this path, the better. But once you're in the dynamic, you have this choice to go into a, a rate tiering scenario, or whether you just, I guess what I'd call ad hoc fluctuation. So when we say increase rates or decrease rates, it's like, oh yeah, but by how much? Now from an operational point of view, sometimes it's easy to have tiers. And here, here's an example here that, you know, your rack rate is 159, then you have a standard tier. So this would be your most commonly sold rate. It's always in the marketplace, it's 139, but when we're busy, we push it up to 159. Or equally, when we're quiet, we go from our standard rate down to 129 as our discount tier. And depending on the room, you'll see one of the frameworks later on, we talk about this, uh, this markup scenario. Uh, depending on the room type you're in, those numbers change as well. But on, on a simple term, that, that's how a rate tiering structure could work. Because it just gives you the trigger to go, yep, up a tier, down a tier, up a tier, down a tier. Back to standard. We'd probably recommend a, um, a more complex tiered structure than that. You know, you can quite easily move into a, a nine or 10 tiered tiering structure. So you've got more stop points in between, smaller gaps, and more ability to manipulate. It's actually been proven that even just to gain $1 is better than jumping maybe a whole $10 tier because you're gonna miss some business on a $10 tier. So it's, if you're really getting sophisticated at this and you can, you can feel the market and you've got all the information in front of you, you can go, you know what, I'm just gonna bump it up by a few dollars. So that would be the, not the opposite, but the alternative to running a tiered system is you're just gonna go with, I'm gonna float the rate. I'm gonna set it to what I want. And you put all these sorts of different rates in the, in the marketplace, depending on what you see happening. But a simplified version is to go in, you know, and this would be a great place to start. Start with a tiered pricing structure. Even if it's just like this, a three tier structure, go for it. And then over time you might find, you know what, I need a, a tier in between rack rate and standard. I need a, a, a moderately busy sort of rate tier at 149. And that's fine, you can build that in. But you know, that, that's a, a nice little model that people tend to um, use. And often you can, depending on the PMS that you're in, often it's easy to set up that tiering type of approach in the, in the system as well. So it becomes quite easy. Not, you know, if, you, if you might understand this better than most in the team, but if you've got a team on the front desk, a tiering structure, again, is quite a, much more easier to communicate up a tier, down a tier, rather than, oh, I'll put it at X, Y, Z. So that's, um, that's rate tiering and the ability to manipulate those rates on an ongoing basis. Just a little side note on, on the rate tiering there, that rack rate. Um, a little tip there, certainly on the OTA channels and your, your, your booking engine, that they always give you an opportunity to put in like your, often they'll call it just your standard rate. Um, don't be confused and put your standard rate in there. We encourage you to put your rack rate in there. Put your expected top rate in there, the, the rate that you would sell if you were busy. And the reason we recommend that is that often the portals and the different channels will actually measure you against that. So if you're saying your standard rate or your rack rate is 159, but consistently you've got 139 in the market, a lot of them will actually show that as a discount or at least show the standard rate. Um, a lot of the booking engines do this as well. Um, and people will get that feeling of, oh, it's not their dearest price, I'm getting it at a reasonable value. Whereas if their standard rate, if it, if it shows there as 139 and you're always selling at 139, they don't feel like they're really being looked after. So that's just a little side note and a tip when it comes to your setup in your booking engines and the portals and the, the OTA portals to always display your rack rate as your standard rate. Uh, so it's rate tiers in a nutshell. Then the, the other thing that you can do, and these are this is, I guess becoming a little bit more sophisticated, but a lot of the solutions out there that'll actually drive your revenue management for you rely upon you telling it what to do at what point in time. And here's an example of how this often works. Um, and there's, there's a number of 
parameters that need to be entered in and you need to make some decisions around this. So if you want your, um, I guess your revenue management to run on autopilot, so you're not looking at this every day, you can fall into a situation like this where you just go, I'm gonna buy this technology solution and populate these fields and it'll just run on autopilot. A word of warning, autopilot will never be the optimal um, revenue management solution. Again, it's better than doing nothing. It'll do a pretty reasonable job, but it's not optimising at the best because the computer doesn't see everything. The computer just follows a mathematical formula. It doesn't know that certain events are on in town. And it, it doesn't know that this weekend feels every year. It doesn't know what you know. It hasn't got the gut feel that you've got. And therefore, potentially, you would have to come in and monitor or change this formula day to day anyway to say, well, hang on, this period here, let's, let's, let's switch the formula off for that period. And you can do, do that on most of the platforms. But in principle, having rules and automation is a really good process to go through to, to let, get you thinking about, well, if it's this busy, with this many days left to run, this is what I'd like to do. So if it's, example here, they have you know, they have three series of, of rules here. They're talking about short, short term, so they're talking about short lead business. So if it's between zero and say three days before arrival, how do we behave then? If we've got three days left to run, how do we behave? Now this depends upon knowing your lead times, doesn't it? So if you know your hotel's got uh, an average um, three day lead time, or even a two day lead time, maybe a very short lead metropolitan business, and this here, like you're not going to put in a perimeter that says, oh, if we're at 80% with three days to go, increase rates. Well, that's probably not going to happen. You mightn't get to 80% until the day of, if, if, you, if you see my point. But you've got this particular form, uh, formula, as an example, works on short-term, medium-term, long-term. So you need to know the lead times you want to operate within. So if it's one to three, and then four to six, and then maybe seven to, seven to 28, whatever it be, this is what I want to happen. I want you to either increase rates, all right, you can see we go back to the yield levers. Um, they're, they're talking about using rate as the only lever to pull. Um, they want you to, you, know, in, in, you, you can tell it to increase rates dependent upon the level of occupancy and dependent upon the number of days out from arrival. Good, it, it's a valuable exercise to go through in the sense that you may never use automation software but if you sit down with your team and have a look at that and have a, have a think about, well, what, what would we do? At, at what point in a typical normalised scenario would we increase rates? Um, so it's, it's a very valuable exercise to, to go through. But that's just another way to be implementing dynamic pricing. Software is possible, but even just going through the exercise of, of creating a formula or, an autom or a potential automation formula for yourself is, is very, very valuable. But the key thing when it comes to yielding is just get started. Just do more than you were doing yesterday, more than you were doing last month. And the, the key to success in yielding is confidence. I think I've said confidence like 47 times throughout these modules, probably more. Yielding comes from confidence. And where does confidence come from? Confidence comes from doing. The more you do, the better feel you get for it. And there's, that's, that's what builds the confidence inside of you to continually making more and more pricing decisions and, and adjustments and you'll get better and better at it. So just get started with yielding. And with that, I just wanna give you a massive pat on the back, a round of applause to say congratulations for making it to the end of the course, the 80% occupancy roadmap. You've made your way through the three simple steps. You've made, made your way through the nine modules. Um, now, if this is your first run through and you've just had a brief run through, well done. <laughs> now go back to the start and go through with a, now a critical eye. Go back through and start to pick out, well, what are the things that are applied to me? And use the strategy selection tool to actually identify those things and, and build them into your master strategy and action selection. If this is your second or third time through, congratulations also. Uh, and I, hope, I really hope things are falling into place for you. I hope you're, you've got a polished strategy and strategy in place, but not just a strategy in place. I hope and I actually expect that you're, you're well underway to already implementing a lot of these things. We've helped you identify, hopefully, 
the 20% that will give you the 80% of the results, the low hanging fruit. And the sooner you get started, the better. You remember it's a perishable stock item and you're losing money every day that you don't start to implement these things. Have a strategy, be, pri be prioritized about what strategies you're gonna knock over and implement first. Remember to think about the projects and programs principle and you've got the four areas that you wanna be focusing on that you either should be running a project or a program in each one of those four areas of development. Look, we really wish you well with the, the growth of your hotel and maximizing the return on investment on your accommodation asset. And we really hope to continue seeing you in the, in the Growth Gurus community, on the Facebook page, on the live coaching calls. We'll always love to hear your questions, always love to hear your feedback, um, always love to hear what new content you'd like to, to be explored, because um, we're here to help at all times. And um, you probably will have noticed uh, already we've started um, thinking of additional content we want to build into the program and we will be posting it in this same platform in the appropriate modules but be posting it as bonus content in most cases. So keep an eye out for bonus content because it'll be about keeping everyone up to date in this rapidly changing environment. I wish you all the best, all the very best with maximising the profits and the performance of your business and all the success and happiness to you all. Thank you.